my show with Arco today and he's gonna talk to us about preparation for the next life um, by Atticus Lish. This is a story set in New York and we're gonna talk about different issues that range from the link between literature and real life and kind of experience versus education in terms of art and also um, kind of potentially antagonistic characters, how do we approach them in literature and how do we approach them in real life and how does that play into toxic masculinity and uh, feminism. All right, any, any leading questions? Yes, <laughs> the first question, so can you tell us what attracted you to the book first and most foremost? Like your, your kind of main, what's the main meaning of the book for you? And if you can tell us a little bit about, um, you know, your younger years and how everything kind of came together. All right, so uh, what attracted me to the book, and this kind of links back to like, what appealed to me thematically, was that uh, as soon as I opened it, there was a sense of immediacy to the prose. Um, and Lish discusses this as well a lot, uh, yeah. about the fact that um, pro prose is something that he sees as almost like an oral experience, like even reading for him, like he he stresses, like he emphasizes the importance of like, the oral element, like what it is to actually read something out. So even in his writing, it sounds like the way people speak. Mm -hmm. So there's a, there's a sort of flow to the narrative where you actually feel as though you're truly following uh, primarily working class characters throughout the book in ways that they would express themselves without undermining the overarching literary voice mm -hmm. of the author. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that was what attracted me, and then, and then that kind of came back to the subject matter. He was, he was dealing with people who kind of occupied maybe the, the sort of lacuna of, yeah. uh, of modern discourse, especially mm -hmm. in the age of globalization. So mm -hmm. the actual story of like a working class immigrant and the story of uh, you know a white working class male yeah. as well. Yeah. So so that was that was really uh, what pulled me into the book. Mm -hmm. and I've read it about six times since. Mm -hmm. like it's it's probably one of my favorites to come mm -hmm. out of recent times, recent yeah. years. Yeah. And uh, I suppose in terms of how that actually links back to my own upbringing mm -hmm. or why I may have a fascination with this was because. Well, first of all, I grew up in Singapore, yeah. and Singapore is a, I mean, some, some would argue it's like a fairly, like, a, you, you, some people go as extreme as an Orwellian state, I wouldn't go that far necessarily, mm -hmm. but <clears throat> there's heavy censorship, it's extremely developed, there's yeah. virtually no crime, and you, you, on, you honestly see like the, the height of development in mm -hmm. Singapore, um, and the example I always give is that... <clears throat> One time I was in a car and the traffic light stopped working and it was probably the first time it's ever happened there, mm -hmm. ever. And the cars would just keep, like, everyone kind of knew when to stop and go yeah. despite the traffic light yeah. not working. Mm -hmm. It's almost as if, like, the social mm -hmm. conditioning or, like, the mm -hmm. civic duty of the people mm -hmm. is on another level. Yeah. Just because of what the society is. However, at the same time, it's, um, it's, a, it's a bubble to grow up in. Yeah. Uh, so... So like when I was when I was going to like my pretty uh, posh mm -hmm. private school mm -hmm. and all that, <clears throat> uh, I was I was always kind of drawn to this idea of uh, you know it it was really this it's it's all to do with that like alt right mm -hmm. bro philosophy mm -hmm. like not it wasn't necessarily alt right then because I I don't mm -hmm. think that was a thing yet yeah. it hadn't yeah. formulated yeah. into the alt right yeah. movement but it was almost like the proto alt right beginnings mm -hmm. like you know all those kids who don't realize that that movie or book fight club is satire yeah yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, those kinds of people yeah, yeah i feel like when you're very young and you just don't get it yeah or or you just uh the characters just are so charismatic mm -hmm. that that you're thinking this would be the way to live in order to yeah. sort of go against what we see as like a bureaucracy mm -hmm. or uh a hyper like capitalistic society mm -hmm. that maybe prioritizes what what i perceive to be like sucking out the souls of people yeah and yeah. i i saw singapore as the epitome of that now mm -hmm. i have a different i have a very different view now mm -hmm. i feel like 
the way I approached that mm -hmm. could have only uh, found its roots within mm -hmm. a hyper, like an extremely developed mm -hmm. bubble, which was yeah. what I was in. So I was starting to romanticize these, mm -hmm. f like almost like hunter gatherer type figures. You know, yeah. You know, pe people living on like the, the mm -hmm. edge of survival. So I wanted to be like that. You feel like this kind of hyper development and this hyper capitalism links to the New York context? Is that maybe something about the book that links back to that experience? Um, in in some regards, but <clears throat> I, I guess what the what the book what you get, which is different what, from other books, is mm -hmm. often within academia when they're approaching these mm -hmm. subjects, they'll have a protagonist who, or like the intended audience can yeah. link back, to, uh, mm -hmm. can relate to, and the intended audience is almost always like these days like a man book or jury, you know. So, if they're doing a story about a working class community, for mm -hmm. instance, you'll often get the po get it from the point of view of the most educated member of yeah. the working class or the most yeah. educated. Yeah, minority. this is what we were getting at uh, in our introduction. This sense that um, the left, the left uh, literary side is somewhat elitist. Like this is appears to be an issue that unfortunately yeah. if we defend these ideas we need to work on so how do you reach this person that is not necessarily the person who is working class and who is educated and knows what they have to fight for and knows how to yeah. but also the person that is going through that same struggle but they're not fortunate enough to have the education or they, they don't have maybe they, they, they haven't gotten it that far uh, and but they still go through the struggle yeah. so how do you how do you work with that like this is something very important for yeah. you and the book right yeah so w within the book what we get instead is like you're not getting the most educated person or the most artistic person within these like working class milieus. like you're just getting people who won't have to survive from one day to the next. Mm -hmm. So I feel like that's where the book gets to the core yeah. of the struggle. Yeah. Because it's not about looking beyond the bubble of like, not looking beyond like the sphere of your own survival. Mm -hmm. It's about that in yeah. itself. It's literally about finding ways to feed yourself mm -hmm. every single day. Mm -hmm. So I think that book brings to the forefront like that, that actual everyday conflict. So I think mm -hmm. there's a sense of almost a literary conflict yeah. of of someone emerging or having mm -hmm. like almost this idea of a hero's journey, but mm -hmm. but what is it when your life is instead just looking to tomorrow because mm -hmm. you need to feed yourself for mm -hmm. the next day? Mm -hmm. So I think that's the way that the book approaches it. Yeah. And so within like this developed society, New York for them is viewed both as like an imposing force, but it's also mm -hmm. viewed as like an actual place of uh, opportunity. Yeah. So I mean, like I said, for us to for us to even see these cities as like monsters of like mm. globalization or hy like hyper capitalism mm -hmm. is is does come from a place of privilege. Yeah. Yeah, because right. for a lot of people they're simply viewing it as a place to get a job. Yeah. You know, and mm. I'm, I'm sure like we're in London right now. Like in London's got the exact same yeah thing, same right? issue definitely. Right. <laughs> like um, I mean you you hear a lot of like maybe college kids talking about it as like a mm -hmm. soulless like soulless city that's been yeah. completely gentrified, but yeah. Yeah. Even though gentrification actually works against working class communities, like a lot of them are still striving for that life that can be found in London. They're still striving to live in a gentrified neighborhood. Many of them, you know, yeah. it, that's the aspiration. So, so I think preparation for the next life captures that. Uh, it captures what happens outside of like this like romantic mm -hmm. lens of New York, mm -hmm. and New York just becomes a place to get jobs. Yeah, it's yeah. So maybe the brilliance of the book is that it doesn't romanticize a certain lifestyle and it, like it faces the fact that it's you know unfortunately not everyone is educated yeah london definitely embodies that tendency to also kind of blame the person uh, and i think it's you know a very very hard conversation to have uh, because Partly, uh, you want to be very strict and very exclusive uh, in the sense that part of the movement in itself 
is to establish a boundary and to say, you know, this or that is not debatable, like the fact that, you know, gender is spectrum, sexuality is spectrum, or like even, you know, the fact that race is a social construct um, and kind of going against that essentialism. We want to say this is non-debatable. However, um, what do we do when people who are affected by this uh, don't see where the problem is? And yeah, this is uh, why I think the book might be so interesting because it doesn't romanticize everyone within that class. It's more of a question maybe of, you know, how do we prepare maybe? How, how do we treat this issue? So sort of like intersectionality in a way, or, yeah. or uh, oh yeah, like basically approaching the fact that many of the minority figures that it's like social progress is trying to put to the forefront may not necessarily hold the same progressive views. Mm. Is that what you're saying, essentially? Yeah, essentially it's, you know, maybe the, the people that, if, if they were informed, would share those views, don't share them because they're not informed. And how do you inform them? when we are so keen, and we are, and I include myself, you are so keen on saying this is not debatable, because it's not. But how do you tell someone, how do you change someone who is in the position of those characters when they don't have the information, they have the problem, but also they haven't had the chance to, you know, talk to someone who does have that information because we do have that boundary that we've established. I mean, it's interesting when we, uh, yeah. we talk about what's debatable or not debatable right now, because, like, of course, like, in terms of what you just mentioned, like, we both believe that uh, it's almost a given for us. Like, these are almost accepted as facts. However, like, in the interest of talking about intersectionality, I mean, uh, for me, uh, because I'm originally Indian, like, the Indian context is very important for me, so this, this conversation always comes back to the Indian context for me. Uh, so, of course, like, within the, within these, like, within the, like, set of views we're talking about, we often link this back to this, this idea of imperialism, and that was my first or, like, West, like, almost colonizing the psyche of the world. Yeah, 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 really yeah but we have had three years. Because we both study comparative literature, so this is exactly the question that the book brings up and that you know, brought up to the table, that we've had three years of education and we aren't bad people, but we, like, personally, sadly, I did need the education. So, you know, that's exactly the, the problem. So what's, what's interesting is, like, even this education, the actually gave us this like, set of views, or like, influence a set of views. Isn't it, it's, it's in also rooted in the West, like, isn't it also rooted like in the history and legacy of imperialism? So, yeah. So, I mean, even the, even like the set of tools that we've been given in order to like, supposedly argue against imperialism or oppose it are given, are, are rooted in the legacy of imperialism, rooted in the legacy of Western imperialism. Yeah, I mean, London. Right, and London. So, what else? I mean, it's, it's this question of like, even, even India right now, um, when, for example, it's faced certain repeals or certain laws of change, like people are talking about the threat of India being Westerners. So when our idea of social progress imposes itself on a country like India, like an Asian country, there are people who are also arguing that this is still neo-colonialist. And it is, in a way. So, so I mean, that's, that's another thing we have to ask. Like, that's another question that comes to mind, which is, like, to what extent are our progressive views exactly neocolonialist? Because our idea of progr progress is like actually synonymous with the form like of westernization, so right? Yeah. So when we talk about these people who aren't necessarily <laughs> talking day, about certain things day, or what's like debatable or not debatable, what we're actually talking about is conditioning them to a certain form of Western mm -hmm. values. Yeah, mm -hmm. like, people who there, have their own set of cultural values. I'm not even saying it's a bad thing. So I was sitting on the I'm just saying it's almost like a 
it's almost we have to be self aware about yeah. that. We have to be self aware about the yeah. fact that we are actually bringing like a Western avenue. So maybe it's not a question of whether or not like it's debatable or not debatable. It's just seeing where we're coming from as well. Yeah, maybe because I feel like there are a certain set of you know basic uh, standards and basic notions that we do need to compromise. To you know, uh, that we cannot compromise on, uh, actually. But also, we need to see how other cultures have had these ideas way before us. You know, that we are, like, many communities did have the idea of, you know, more than two genders, so kind of going against that, and we didn't even get to that until now, and now it seems like we are the ones coming up with it. Once we're really not, so maybe does it also lead to the fact that Let's cease to be the teachers and let's listen, you know, to others as like uh, I mean, I think even beyond that, I mean, it's, it's maybe not even just like talking about this teacher-student yeah. binary, but just a question of saying, okay, if we're going to be pushing for certain social appeals, so let's let's forget about the fact that this is neocolonialist. Like even if we're going to push for them, because we are. I mean, it's neocolonialist, but I'm still going to be. Yeah, it's just like stand by certain course. values so to do with yeah. minority representation, like sexual yeah. minority, mm -hmm. etc. Et right? so I'll still be yeah, arguing for that, even if it, even if the form of like sexual minority representation I'm talking about is uh, a distinctly Western mm -hmm. discourse. Mm -hmm. It's like a Western <laughs> form of that discourse, mm -hmm. right? Um, because we're talking about like Western categories and Western labels, mm -hmm. because they are slightly different. So, for example, someone in a different culture may have had uh, may have had like a different idea of gender and different sets of genders, but it's still not does still doesn't directly translate to our modern view right? mm -hmm. or our Western view, yeah. I should say, rather than modern. Mm -hmm. But <clears throat> but what the what the book gets at, I think, is just a matter of. Uh, of let, let's just forget like the actual pushing for social change first. Let's educate ourselves on the people as well. Um, let's educate ourselves on where their views are coming from. Because if we simply come from a place of saying their view needs to change, that's not going to help. We have to actually ask why they think that's helpful for them to think that way. Because, because I think contrary to popular belief, a lot of these a lot of these convictions don't don't necessarily come from. Actually, I think a lot of people. Like a lot of these uh, convictions don't necessarily come from a place of hate, but rather than... No. For you personally, what was it that uh, made a change? How did you come to change your mind? Alright, so... Basically, uh, it was a series of small things over the years, but what it began with, really, was uh, realizing the fragility of, of basically a persona I'd created. Mm -hmm. And because it was, it was really a performed persona, So it really began with saying, how, how, how does one affirm their masculinity here? Or how does one affirm themselves or validate this, this idea that they've created in their heads? And a lot of, a lot of like making yourself seem tough is actually subjugating people or, or basically uh, pushing that sort of alpha beta binary where some, like, some will serve you and you can serve these like the weaker males. Mm -hmm. And that was the way it worked, but the cracks started coming certain people just wouldn't listen mm -hmm. and that that's when I realized that what I had in this form of power that I had on a very small bit, like low level was was extremely fickle mm -hmm. and of course this extends not to just uh, not to just like my own experience but the patriarchy in general the, the entire the, the fragility of it relies on the fact that if any of the people who are subjugated basically form like the lower echelons of mm -hmm. this power structure. Mm -hmm. If any of them realize their form of agency or realize the power that they truly have, yeah. the entire system breaks apart. And that's why it's that's why it, one would argue that it's unsustainable. Yeah. It's unsustainable basically on this idea that not everyone within the system can actually partake and as soon as they do, as soon as they start to push themselves and push basic rights, mm -hmm. that's when things start going. That's yeah. stuff and things start falling apart, and that's yeah. really what we're talking about when we have the modern crisis of masculinity. Yeah. Um, and actually, that's when you realize like 
there's a lot of fear and weakness that comes in like with this macho mm -hmm. posturing and this mm -hmm. it comes yeah. it comes in with this insecurity, this idea that you're saying that now I'm being victimized because you are not listening to me, you are not uh, you're not obeying my demands or being subservient. Yeah, it's kind of like assuming that that unjust privilege was a given. Yeah. Uh, without realizing that actually if we came to terms with the fact that it's a privilege that costs things to other people, then you know, you would also realize what is oppressing you. So it's yeah. a twofold thing. Like if you don't realize who you're oppressing, you can't realize who's yeah. oppressing you. Maybe so maybe that's what these working class characters you know, represent perhaps, and that's how, like was it realizing that that made you change in your views and kind of what you were following and aspiring to be? Well, in terms of how the characters represent, it's, it, maybe it doesn't fit quite uh, too well, quite too comfortably within the same conversation, mm -hmm. but it's, it's really more of a fact that for a lot of people, mm -hmm. um, this sort of unsustainable uh, no, power structure. Maybe maybe unsustainable is not the right word because we have actually sustained it for a very, very long time. But this fickle power structure, rather, um, is the reality for so many people. So, for example, I could come to the realization that I did because I had other options within my like private school background. But they co this is covered in preparation of the next life as well. Um, and I've seen this in my own experiences and with certain some Islam areas. Like the understanding of power is very different because for some people they can't necessarily like they don't have a, they can't see a viable mm -hmm. avenue out of what they consider to be mm -hmm. hyper masculine posturing. Because for them it's not posturing, it's not necessarily a performance that's because to see it as a performance is to have a degree of like self awareness about what you're yeah. actually practicing. Yeah, maybe that's the, the issue. Yeah. Self -awareness. Lack of self-awareness because suddenly your mask is just your yeah. identity. Um, what you're being pressured into doing is just your identity and that's a reality. And so for a lot of these people, there's no actual way out of this. They don't see a way out of this binary because the way they see it is that if I'm going to make sure that my family survives and potentially prospers mm -hmm. even, then I'm going to have to basically beat someone else down. I'm going to have to... Yeah, that's the illusion of yeah. capitalism and how, yeah. in order to succeed, you need to win over someone else. So it's maybe the core... And, and, the and maybe it's maybe it's not an illusion within certain groups because within... I mean, obviously it's an... It, I mean, it, I mean, it, be, yeah, it yeah. isn't because the system, unfortunately, yeah. that's how it works. Yeah. Uh, but it, the, the illusion is perhaps the fact that it has to be this way. And I think that is... Me. Yeah, and, but within certain like sections of society, even like it, it doesn't even come back to like the whole capitalist argument. It's literally just I'm in I'm within my neighborhood. And this mm -hmm. is how I survive within my neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And once we see it on that small basis, like mm -hmm. we once we see it like on that micro level once more, <coughs> that's when we can start having those conversations. Yeah. That's when we can have, start talking to this guy who who actually, for example, he's in prison. Let's say. And that's how the system for him works in prison. Mm -hmm. It's that he has no other way to survive, but like his mask is also his mask is also the shield, mm -hmm. right? So yeah, yeah um, so even for me to break out of it, what came from like mm -hmm. position of privilege? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So <laughs> that's an open question that we are going to leave. How do we cross those bridges? How do we? bridge that gap between education and actually, yeah, that's the problem, right? It actually, many times, self-awareness comes within a position of privilege, so maybe we're not even, like, we're, I mean, we do have power, but, you know, it would be great to find a way that we can reach everyone, especially who needs it. Thank you so much for being with us today um, and you can find Argos photo shoot on